In this chapter, we will talk about two major processes that lead to changes in the local species community in the oceans already right now. So one is climate change that makes species track their climate zone. And number two is that humans are transporting marine organisms all over the world, mainly through shipping activity. And the, these latter species introductions, they may enhance diversity locally, but they globally um, lead to the prevalence of weedy species that are very resistant and can be transported. And so finally, you will learn that marine ecology has to deal with this completely newly assembled communities that will interact in a different way because they are new players in the game, basically. So climate zones, they are already on the move and it's projected that by the end of uh, the century, uh, mean average uh, sea surface temperatures will have gone up by two to three degrees. And the best example for that are large data sets of mobile species, for example, fishes or rays, where we can show uh, very nicely and very close to the predictions of their preferred climate uh, conditions that they track. So mainly this would be then a poleward shift uh, with the uh, warming temperatures and the poleward shift of the respective climate zones. So in other words, very mobile species, they don't have a problem for the moment finding themselves in exactly the climate zone they like temperature wise. But of course, many other species, they are either not mobile because they are grown at a place like marine plants, but also many sessile animals like sponges or barnacles or mussels. And if they don't have wide dispersing larvae, they may be left behind. So we get a desynchronization of those migratory movements and that leads to a decoupling of species compositions and to a completely new assembly. The second major process we have to talk about that reassembled species um, has to do with globalization and here in the literal sense. So the globalization of the economy means that a lot of huge cargo ships uh, are going across our major ocean basins on a daily basis. And those cargo ships, they need more or less ballast water and specialized tanks to keep their balance, not to tilt over uh, when <coughs> the cargo uh, is unloaded in a port. And within this ballast water, huge amounts of either small planktonic organisms or propagules of larger organisms or larvae are transported all around the globe. Of course, with the more likelihood, the more robust uh, the species or the propagules are to endure uh, one or two or three weeks in a dark and partly dirty ballast water tank. So here comes now the selection for weedy, robust species that may on a global scale and on the longer run be a big problem for local diversity. And we say also in invasion biology that we have the tenth rule. If we have uh, uh, imagined 1,000 species at a coastal area where a certain port lies, then about 100 get entrapped into a ballast water tank. About 10 uh, would then survive the transport across an ocean basin like the Atlantic or the Pacific um, and would be <coughs> uh, brought into the new habitat and of those uh, then one would establish or even become a pest. So if you now look at the time series in several European oceans where the best time records are available, um, then we do see that the cumulative amount of non-indigenous species, so those that have established in their new habitat, <coughs> is steadily rising. I give you now a few examples of those non-indigenous species that became invasive, so that really made a mass population explosions. One of which is the comb jelly Nemiopsis lydii that entered the Black Sea in the 1980s um, with very li high likelihood through uh, ballast water and uh, <coughs> uh, correlated with the ex uh, population expansion of that uh, comb jelly 
the anchovy and sardine fisheries in the Black Sea completely collapse. And scientists can now start tracking where those invasions come from. They can do that by means of the genetic fingerprint. And here we uh, see a very interesting pattern that Nemeopsis came into the Black Sea from an area in the Gulf of Mexico in the 1980s. And then there was a new invasion into the North Sea and the Baltic Sea coming from uh, the area of New England <coughs> that also contained different genotypes. Another example uh, that happened recently is the lionfish that was um, probably via aquarium trade imported from the Indo-Pacific to the Caribbean Sea where it exploded in population, devastates, uh, engulfs the, the natish, native fish fauna of the Caribbean and spreads with the rates of several hundred kilometers per year. One prominent hypothesis why some species uh, that are non-indigenous become invasive is the enemy release hypothesis that posits that there are no parasites uh, or predators on those novel species. Aquaculture or mariculture is another area <coughs> where intentional or unintentional uh, introductions happen. One case is the Pacific oyster that's grown in culture in many European uh, sites now and it has <coughs> evaded uh, the cultivation sites, the mariculture sites proper and spread uh, throughout shallow uh, tidal flats. Uh, at first glance that may seem nice, so there's now a lot of oysters for people to pick. The problem is that wading birds, such as this oyster catcher, that contrary to its name is not feeding oysters but likes blue mussels, cannot feed on Pacific oysters. They're just too bulky. They basically starve since the oysters cover all the areas that previously were covered by cockles and blue mussels. This already tells us uh, that uh, the food web is reconfigured by invasive species uh, and that, <coughs> that enriching uh, the local fauna uh, with a new species doesn't, is not necessarily a good thing. So the management implications of, <coughs> uh, of range shifts and evasions are that in terms of the range shift uh, we were talking about initially um, we need to study the new interactions um, among the species that are on the move versus those that are left behind and those that have problems in dispersing to more, uh, to more pole worlds. One may even think in terms of ecosystem management to deliberately bring them uh, to aid them uh, uh, traveling the dispersal distances that they cannot make on their own. And secondly, in terms of invasions, it's very important to deal with the ballast water problem aside from paying attention more in mariculture that we do not transfer unintentionally other organisms with our target organisms. The International Maritime Organization has developed a legal contract, but so far not enough nations have uh, assigned to it. So here uh, it's definitely very important that this EMO ballast water treaty is signed by a uh, critical mass of nations. And thirdly, there's still a huge uh, effort needs to be done science-wise to find techniques to um, sterilize large amounts of ballast water when ships are at ports where basically every hour costs thousands um, of dollars for the ship owners. So taken together we see now that um, the, the ecology is changing rapidly um, at all locations uh, all around the globe in the oceans and uh, we need to deal with the changing composition of the species and where we can in terms of managing the invasions we should at least slow down the rate uh, by which communities are newly assembled.